nail on it. All right, now I'm gonna share my screen. So today, um, we do also have a video that I have put in the link in the chat, but I'll tell you when we're gonna watch that um, because I just couldn't uh, tell you about Stone Mountain without showing you Stone Mountain, just in case you've never been, because you know I don't know if you're from here. So this whole chapter um, is about Georgia. So one of the things that the author does over the course of this book is he sort of drives around the entirety of the Southeast and looks at different Civil War sites um, and interviews like really specific people. And so we only so far have read the chapter, well, the first chapter and the chapter about the Civil War gasm, uh, which they did all in one week. But he spent like two years uh, traveling around and going to all different kinds of sites and, and talking about what he saw. And so this chapter is what he saw in Georgia. Um, and in part, I wanted you to read this chapter because we just watched Gone with the Wind. So it's going to be kind of personal, like it's going gonna, it's gonna to sound familiar, I think, in a great way. So let's begin. Um, so the first thing that he does when he decides to go to Georgia is go to Atlanta, which I get, Atlanta's great. Um, but bear in mind, this was written in 1996. Um, so it is a little bit of an older view of Atlanta, and yet at the same time, it certainly isn't. Um, so this is kind of how Atlanta had been described to him, and I thought this was so gorgeous. Um, every time I look at Atlanta, I see what a quarter million Confederate soldiers died to prevent. Damn. Uh, and then, of course, the only uh, thing remarkable about Atlanta is the number and variety of table dancing establishments, uh, which is true. We do have uh, quite the variety and, and high quality. So basically, they're sort of setting up Atlanta as this like anti-Southern city, as this like new and brash and young and bold and like kind of tacky, like maybe a little bit trashy. Um, and to be fair, that is how the rest of the South sees us. Atlanta is not Georgia. Um, and Atlanta is not the South. Like this is, you know, it's a whole different thing, the city. And in part, that's because of the way that we have always been a transportation hub. So one of the things that we talked about um, when we were talking about the history of Atlanta and Gone with the Wind was the fact that we used to be called Terminus. So it used to be that five, I think, yeah, five uh, railroad lines intersected in Atlanta. And then we made it so that five interstates intersected in Atlanta. And then we built one of the biggest airports in the world. So essentially, if you want to travel, especially through the Southeast, you have to go through Atlanta. And so in that sense, Atlanta's just vastly different from everywhere else. Like there's no, you would never have to go to Savannah or Charleston or New Orleans. Like those places are all the way in their own little corners, but Atlanta is in the middle and you have to go. So Atlanta has always been really different than all the other Southern cities. It's always been faster. It's always been like ruder, uh, kind of more expensive, better on technology and that sort of thing. So his assessment of Atlanta is not entirely wrong. Uh, this is the way that he described it, especially in regard to Gone with the Wind. Um, and he's making a comparison here between Rhett Butler and Ashley Wilkes, which again, should sound familiar. You're all up on Gone with the Wind at this point, right? Um, so he said that Atlanta's always been on the go. Never was a moonlight and magnolia city like Savannah or Charleston. It always had more of a Rhett Butler attitude than an Ashley Wilkes one which I thought was kind of great. Um, and it is true. Like Atlanta, we don't think of it as one of those calm southern cities where everybody's really genteel and has perfect manners. Like Atlanta's fast and Atlanta's diverse. Um, and so setting Atlanta up as different than the rest of Georgia is kind of crucial for the rest of this process because we don't think of it as quite so backwards in a sense. So we'll get there. So one of the things that he notices um, as he's touring around Atlanta looking for Civil War specific things is the way that Atlanta sort of regularly reinvents itself. Um, so you probably or maybe have noticed that this one of the symbols of Atlanta is the phoenix um, and our original motto was resurgence and that's in part because Atlanta burns down a lot. Um, we're, we're about to burn down again, I think, um, but also because Atlanta is sort of constantly trying to reinvent itself. So first, you know, it was a, an industrial city and then it was like a, a largely black city like it was if the all the things that held the civil rights movement back hadn't happened. Atlanta would have been one of the very first like progressive black cities. Um, and then, you know, we had the Olympics and then we had like all this other stuff. So Atlanta is always trying to project this image of like too busy to hate, and, like too busy to be um, held back by the things that are happening to the rest of the world. And the Olympics is a great example of that. Um, so he was touring Atlanta right after um, the Olympics had, 
occurred, I think. And so the Olympics, as you may recall, if you lived here, were in 96. Um, and one of the things that Atlanta did was basically destroy all of the parts of Atlanta that were ugly in preparation for the Olympics. So they literally like rounded up the homeless people and put them on buses and drove them like a couple hundred miles away, like they just drove them to other cities. Um, and they went and knocked down a bunch of the things that had fallen over. And they went and knocked down a bunch of the houses they just sort of didn't like because they were ugly. So they destroyed a lot of um, project houses and a lot of houses that were in like traditionally black owned neighborhoods. Um, and they knocked out a lot of things specifically that were next to the interstate because they were afraid that, you know, people from other countries and from the Olympic Committee would look at what Atlanta really looked like and how there were poor people um, and that they wouldn't let us have the Olympics. So they just bulldozed it. And it, it was hyper questionable. Like if they had done something to improve the city, that would have been one thing, but instead they just bulldozed it and pretend it was never there. So like for instance, you've probably seen the um, dorms that Georgia Tech uses now that are on um, 75, 85, like right in the middle of downtown. And they built those for the Olympics. Those were initially Olympic villages, but they had to knock down a bunch of like, you know, low income housing to do that. So that, that's sort of just one example of like the way that they sort of tried to beautify the city on a really surface level. Um, so the author doesn't dig into that as much as I sort of would have liked, but one of the things that he noticed uh, was when people were talking about Civil War monuments, and they said that they were going to take them down uh, for the Olympics because they didn't want anybody to think that we were still obsessed with the Civil War, um, and then they were going to put them back. Um, and this was like peak Atlanta. This was our whole deal. We were like, we'll just put that back after the Olympics. We'll just, we'll let the homeless people come back after the Olympics. I'm like, we'll, we'll build some more affordable housing after the Olympics. And of course, we did none of that. Um, because the Olympics traditionally actually bankrupts the cities where they hold it. It's actually, it seems like it's going to be a good idea and it's almost always a bad idea. Um, that said, I love the Olympics and I'm sad they're not happening. But this is sort of some examples. Um, here on the left, uh, they're, you know, destroying an old factory, I think, uh, to make room for Centennial Olympic Park. And then on the right, some uh, pretty amazing graffiti. So for a lot of Atlanta residents, especially for a lot of like inner city Atlanta residents, the Olympics were not a good thing um, because they totally disrupted their life and they destroyed their neighborhoods. Um, but for a lot of like suburb people and business owners, they were a good thing because they brought in a lot of business. So it's kind of the, you know, archetypal American story. Uh, the rich got richer, the poor got poorer. And then we got Centennial Olympic Park, which by the way is currently closed um, because they were using it as a site for protesters to gather. So they just put a fence up around Centennial Olympic Park downtown and you can't use it anymore for now. So then in the book, uh, the author goes to Stone Mountain. So this is something that we've been talking about a little bit this semester because as people are going through and removing uh, Confederate monuments, one of the ones that keeps coming up is Stone Mountain because you can't remove it. It's, I mean, it's not just that it's gigantic, it's part of a very big rock. Um, the largest piece of exposed limestone in the world, maybe. So basically, we don't know what to do about Stone Mountain. And this is one of the things that we'll talk about tomorrow is what, what y'all think we should do. And I know we've talked about it a little bit, but it's a little bit more uh, relevant now than it used to be. So I wanted to show it to you in case you had never seen it. Um, so on the left here, you can sort of get an idea of scale of how big the mountain itself is. And the mountain, um, it's not really a mountain, it's just a, it's just a real big rock that sticks up higher than rocks normally do. Um, but the mountain itself is, is gigantic and it's surrounded by like a great big park. And I don't know, again, I don't know if you guys have been there, but you can go just to like walk around or you can climb up the mountain or whatever. Um, but then here on the right is the relief. So sort of similar to Rushmore, they carved um, like a relief of, you know, historical figures. And so if you're there in person, you can see it a little bit more clearly, um, although they have gotten a little bit weathered over the years. So um, in the relief, of course, we have uh, the Holy Trinity. We've got Robert E. Lee and Ulysses S. Grant, and I think that's probably Nathan Bedford Forrest there with the horse who looks mad. Um, so one of the things that they do at Stone Mountain, that again, I don't know if you've ever seen before, is the laser show. <laughs> Um, so in the book, he describes the laser show, and it's, it's a bizarre thing because it's really like peppy, and they, and they redo it every couple of years to add new music to it. Um, and it's kind of trippy, like it's uh, the way that the, you know, sort of lights and the fog and stuff go in and out, and the music. And it's, it's really like sort of a sensory overwhelming thing. Um, and so again, I, just, I couldn't resist showing it to you. So I'm going to unshare my screen right now so we can all go watch it. And I think that what we figured out um, in the beginning of the Zoom lectures was that it doesn't really work if I show the screen 
on mine, um, which is a shame. So we can't exactly all watch it together. But over here um, in, the, in the chat section, I put the link to the YouTube video. And what I'd like for you to do is start the YouTube video about 17 minutes in. Uh, the, the laser show, by the way, is real long. Um, but we're only going to watch the part where they use the relief uh, because the rest of it, I mean, is of interest, but not necessarily for this class. So what we'll do is click on this link and then everybody go uh, separately, I guess. Sorry about that part. But again, this is the only thing we can figure out that worked. Uh, so everybody go watch just for a few minutes, but make sure you start at the 17 minute mark. I don't see the link in the chat window. I don't either. Oh, I'm so sorry, you guys. Let me try it again. Is there now? Yep. Okay, good. Yeah, sorry about that, you guys. I have posted it. Yes. yes. I guess maybe I have to wait till you're here to post things like that. I don't know. I'm learning. Okay. All right, 17 minute mark. You're, you'll hear Elvis. That's how you'll know you're there. <laughs> 
Okay, just come back whenever Elvis stops singing and you hear the fireworks. Yes, good. Did you watch the whole thing? Just the fire, the, the, okay. Um, so we'll talk about this tomorrow. And this is like the, this is one of the worst things about teaching online is that we can't just like all watch this together uh, as a group. Um, but it's weird and it's, and it's creative. And I kind of enjoy that part of it. Like the part where like the horses look like they're kind of like running forward, even though they're holding still, like, oh, that's pretty clever. Um, but it's a, a really, I think a great example of the way that we think about the war and the way that we sort of like memorialize these people. Because if you were watching this, like, uh, and again, I'm sorry that we can't have more discussion, but your impression might be that the Civil War was like a quick, noble thing, and then it was over, and then everybody was fine. Like, you know, there's, there's no sort of indication of what the war was about, or what the people were fighting over, or whether it was terrible. It was just like, there are these three guys on horses, and then when it ends, Robert E. Lee breaks his sword, and everybody's back. Um, and there's that beautiful song, and I don't know if you, if you guys have ever heard that song before. That's a real old song. Um, and it was like essentially the song of Dixie. Um, and Dixie is so called because of the Mason-Dixon line. So in the beginning of the war, they decided to divide the North and the South um, at the Mason-Dixon line, which you've probably heard of. And so the South uh, became Dixie. And a lot of people are actually dropping that designation lately uh, because of its uh, connotations regarding the Civil War. So you may have heard about like how the Dixie Chicks are just calling themselves the Chicks now, for instance. Um, so this, this idea of Dixie being not just Southern, but specifically Confederate is kind of something that's happening right now. Um, and for those of you, by the way, who are tuning into this later, I will post the link on YouTube, so just go watch it on, uh, when, you, when you have a moment. So I'm anxious to hear tomorrow whether you guys have ever been to Stone Mountain and seen the show in all its glory, because uh, it's, it's intense, and I do wish we could go on a field trip and watch the whole thing. So I am going to uh, switch back now to the PowerPoint. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you. So in the book, uh, one of the things that the author talks about is going to see this laser show and how kind of weird it was to work that Confederate part in with the, re with the rest of the show. So if you have a minute, I do encourage you to watch a little bit more of the show because it's really like frenetic, like there's just so much happening and there's a lot of fireworks and there's a lot of like colors and music and it's a whole thing. Um, but it's sort of something you would expect to see anywhere in America except for the sudden venture into Civil War territory. So Stone Mountain um, is another one of our like uh, sort of historic sites that's under a lot of pressure right now. Um, last week, there was another armed uh, demonstration there, um, and it has sort of famously held meetings uh, for the Klan. So it's a, it's a, it's a weird place uh, in terms of our current struggle with the Confederacy and like what we're going to do about it. So I encourage you to keep an eye on Stone Mountain. Uh, Aside from just being a real big piece of rock, uh, there's some interesting things happening there because of the historical significance that we have like associated with it. So um, the next thing that the author does in the book is he goes to meet with this guy who is the president um, of the Heritage Preservation Association. So this is one of those groups that um, mostly is dedicated to like statues and monuments and that sort of thing, but in a slightly different twist than the daughters of the Confederacy or the sons of the Confederacy, they also do lawsuits. So the Heritage Preservation um, now technically is no longer in action, they've transitioned to a separate thing, but on the bottom here, that was their, on the bottom right, that was their seal. Uh, they have since 2015 disbanded their uh, Facebook page, but it's still there. And so basically their goal was um, to like take care of what they called heritage violations. So for the most part, this had to do with the Confederate flag. Uh, like most of the time, it was in regard to, to Confederate flags and to occasionally Confederate historical sites. But the majority of what they did uh, was essentially sue people for trying to remove the Confederate flag. And the guy that they talked to was so interesting um, and 
like, you know, he described him as like a really clean cut white guy, like kind of a preppy dude, like relatively young. Um, and I thought it was really interesting that he refused to indicate how many uh, members they had. I suspect he didn't want to tell him because there were so few, like I wouldn't be surprised if it's like this guy and like four other people. Uh, but who knows, he, it's possible that he didn't tell them how many there were because he wanted to hide their large numbers, uh, which was of course an old Confederate battle tactic, so it's possible. But basically, he, he described the members of the Heritage Foundation and also, um, you know, like Southerners with a Confederate past as the chosen people. He said, we're the chosen people surviving many atrocities. And this is a, a weird choice of language. Uh, usually when we hear this language, it's very specifically regarding Jewish people um, and in terms of like being the chosen people and surviving, you know, thousands of years of hardships. But just to describe um, pro-Confederate people as the chosen people surviving atrocities, it's a bold move. Uh, like what atrocities? They took your flag away? Like that, you know, they're, they're not like killing everyone uh, that you love and like enslaving uh, your children, uh, which I would describe as a real atrocity, but like whatever. So I thought that was really interesting, the, the way that he talks to this guy. And this is another one of the things that I'd like to talk about tomorrow because the Heritage Preservation Society um, has, has dissolved. They dissolved their board, which does suggest that there was more than one person. And they have changed themselves into the American Institute for Conservation. Uh, which is appropriately vague. I kind of dig it. Like conservation of what? Uh, landmarks? Animals? Water? I don't know. And then they say that their, their goal is preserving cultural heritage. And I think this is a really great example of being vague in a political context. Because like preserving cultural heritage, I could totally get behind. Like we should, for instance, uh, stop that pipeline that is going through sacred Native American territory. But I'm pretty sure that's not what he's talking about. I'm pretty sure when he says uh, cultural heritage, he means uh, white Confederates. Um, so it's a, it's a great example. It's sort of like when people say they're pro-life and what they mean is that they're anti-abortion. It's like there's an umbrella phrase, but they're talking about a very specific thing. Um, but politically, it's a smart thing to do. You need to sort of be able to advertise yourself to a wide range of people. And one of the best ways to do that is to use real vague language. And also, I think, remember we talked about last week, or again, the week before, um, dog whistles which is this idea that you are saying something but only the people who know what you mean know what you mean so this is another sort of example of that when somebody when a white person says that they want to preserve their cultural heritage it's almost always what they mean um so again one of the things that we'll talk about tomorrow is what you saw over the last uh two weeks really because one of the things that i asked you to think about before we uh went on vacation uh was sort of like what's happening in your world in regard to the Civil War and the Confederacy and the monuments and the flag. Um, and so this is one of the things that I'm curious to hear about from your point of view, because this sort of language um, is very careful and it's very specific. And it's something that actually we're hearing kind of a lot of lately. Um, we heard it from President Trump last week. I don't know if you guys saw that, or maybe just two days ago. Um, he said that the, the NASCAR had made a bad decision in regards to the flag, which I thought was really interesting as well. So we're sort of leaning into this divisiveness right now. And so I want you to be able to pay attention to the kind of language that you're hearing, because this is what I'm talking about in regard to like divisiveness. All right. So, uh, oh, then, so then he goes to the Ruffin Flag Company, because basically he's trying to figure out um, where people get Confederate flags and where they get uh, like the rebel flags and where they get the, you know, the old, like, not just um, Robert E. Lee's battle flag, but like the other ones, you know. And so he goes and he meets this guy who really is named Ruffin. Um, and I was curious to see if this guy is still around, and he is. Uh, so that's his store there on the side. He's in Washington, Georgia. Uh, which I don't even know where that is. Again, I'm not from here, sorry. Uh, but it's up to the Northeast, I think. Um, and so he's still there, still making flags. But I thought what was so interesting was that in the, in the book, he describes his flag business as sort of like upscale. Like one of the things that he realized was that people didn't want um, cheap Confederate flags. They wanted like well-made Confederate flags. And so he made a bunch of those and he made battle flags, but he described his store as selling nothing racist. So he said like, yeah, we make Confederate flags, but nothing racist, which is like, Okay. Um, and these days, I noticed on the website, they're actually selling Black Lives Matter flags too. So essentially, he's just sort of selling whatever flags he thinks people want, which is on the one hand, peak capitalism, uh, but on the other hand, sort of morally gray, I think, sort of ethically gray. Um, I think it's, it's kind of bold to not take a stance in terms of what you sell. He's just sort of like, I made y'all what you want. So over here on the right, uh, you can see this is a picture that was on like the Google reviews from the inside of his store. 
And a lot of what we're seeing um, is Confederate, but it's, it's mixed in pretty heavily with just all sorts of other stuff. Um, you know, there's American flags and um, there's that don't tread on me flag that I was telling you about. And so essentially it's just sort of a flag store, but it happens to sell a lot of Confederate things. And the way that this guy described it, the way that Ruffin described it was that there was a resurgence of interest in Confederate stuff um, because people were essentially tired of being blamed. So his argument was that people were sort of coming back to the Confederate message and the Confederate flag and the Confederate identity um, because they were tired of sort of like being shat upon. So the way that he describes it is that Southerners are sick, or sorry, are getting tired of taking it on the chin. They're getting more aggressive. And again, this is the thing that I'm really interested in talking about tomorrow, this idea that people are, are sort of re-embracing and like clinging to this identity because they feel like they're being blamed uh, for a lot of other things. And so people are essentially tired um, of being made fun of for like being slow and dumb, like being part of the South, because again, I don't know if you've left the South, but that is what people say about us. Uh, but this idea that maybe Southerners are, are getting tired of being poor and being slow and being poorly educated and being unhealthy and being sort of the laughing stock of everybody else. And so they're sort of like re-embracing this identity that they used to have um, and like leaning into it as a way of possibly reclaiming it. Like, you know, we talk about people reclaiming words sometimes. Um, but I think this is a really interesting argument, this idea that the Southerners are tired of being blamed for the Civil War, and so they're trying to, like, get aggressive about their beliefs. Um, which, again, fascinating. So, then, uh, the author moves on, and he starts to look into the thing that people are most obsessed about in regard to Georgia, which is Tara. So apparently this happens all the time. Um, there are some like, you know, Confederate museums and there are several now, uh, Terra museums and there's of course the Margaret Mitchell house. And apparently one of the things that people ask a lot when they come to Georgia um, for tourism is where is Terra? And the answer is that Terra never existed. Um, the author made it up. It was sort of a composite of like, you know, other houses that she had seen before. And it was in the town uh, where her grandmother lived. It was in Jonesboro, but it wasn't like a real house. Like there's not, a Terra. Um, they built a facade for the movie, but not a whole house for the movie either. And we'll talk about the facade here in a minute. But basically, when people came to Georgia, they wanted to see it. And I'm kind of surprised that nobody's just built it. I think that would just be like, just go on. But uh, what we have instead, uh, it gets kind of complicated. So here at the bottom, you can see that people uh, will sort of essentially help you plan an itinerary if you want to do a Gone with the Wind tour. So you can spend the whole weekend like going from site to site to site and just like looking at all the Gone with the Wind things. Um, and even though there's not a real Terra, people have gone out of their way to make this happen. And one of the things um, that the author points out is that Gone with the Wind is one of the things that are sort of keeping our idea of the cultural, like the antebellum South alive. So he says, Gone with the Wind had done more to keep the Civil War alive and to mold its memory than any history book or event since Appomattox. So essentially, this is, again, this is why I showed you Gone with the Wind, uh, because when people think about the South and when they think about the Civil War, that's what they picture. They picture this, like, you know, sort of technicolor 1930s movie. So this idea that Gone with the Wind is at least in part responsible for our sort of Southern identity and our Confederate identity is a fascinating thing. So people come looking for Tara. There's no Tara, uh, but there's people who will pretend to be Tara. So he goes and interviews this woman who I thought was such an interesting woman, and her name is Nellie Meadows, um, and she is a Scarlett O'Hara impersonator. And by the way, she still is. Her website is a trip. Uh, like, it's, it's wow. Um, and I encourage you to go look at it if you have a bunch of free time. But basically what she does is she dresses up in specifically, like, costumes from the movie um, that she has made herself, and she goes to events. Um, and so some of these events are what you would expect. They're like antebellum parties or they're like uh, Gone with the Wind parties or they're like Civil War celebrations, you know, but some of them just really aren't. Um, and some of them she goes and like meets with uh, tourist groups. And I thought it was especially interesting that Gone with the Wind is really popular among Japanese business groups. Um, and this is this runs a little deeper than you might think, um, in part because a lot of the gender norms are kind of the same. Like uh, Japanese women very often are meant to be, um, you know, pretty and, and small and meek and quiet and calm. Um, like there's this sort of like performance of femininity that is that is common cross-culturally in that regard. So the way that Scarlett was taught to behave is very similar uh, to the way that Japanese women have traditionally been taught to behave. And again, bear in mind, this was in the 90s. Um, so things have changed a little bit since then. 
But basically, they discovered that she was extremely popular among Japanese tourist groups, um, and she is still still available. Um, I also thought it was really interesting that she doesn't particularly care about Scarlett, um, and she was thinking about her next job being, um, I think, an evangelist. Like, basically, she says she just follows the most popular book, which I thought was actually a pretty clever thing to say, um, because the Bible is the best-selling book in America, but Gone with the Wind was number two for a long time. Um, but basically, there's a whole cottage industry of people who pretend to be Scarlett, and she has several other people on her roster who will come uh, and pretend to be like Rhett or Ashley. She has several mammies, which I was like, hmm. Uh, but basically, this is her job. She, like, cosplays um, as, as Gone with the Wind. And she is, by the way, still available if you would like to hire her. Um, so then he goes looking for the facade for Gone with the Wind for Tara. So basically, they built um, part of the house when they made the movie. Uh, there was, you know, the facade of the house. Like, you may remember they had a couple scenes on the porch and things like that, or her running up to the house, but they didn't build a house behind it. And so when the movie was over, they sort of took the facade off of the house and sold it. And where it went was a big question for a long time, because a lot of people wanted it, because they wanted to, like, you know, put it up and charge people to look at it. And so at one point in the 80s, this woman bought it. So this is Betty Talmadge. Um, and she's amazing. Uh, she's kind of a boss bitch. Uh, well, she's dead now, but she was kind of a boss bitch. Um, so her husband was um, like a, a really a pretty powerful senator from Georgia, and so she became really famous as a DC hostess. And he doesn't really get into it in the book, uh, but their parties, uh, I believe, as you say, were lit. Uh, people got in a lot of trouble. Uh, like it, it was, it was always sort of vague what happened at their parties, but you can guess. Um, and so she was really famous as a hostess in D.C. for a long time, and then uh, she was the first lady of Georgia for a little while. Her husband was the governor, and then it turned out that he'd been embezzling a ton of money, um, a lot of which they kept in the pockets of their fur coats in their closet, which. Um, and so he got essentially fired, uh, and he was under investigation, so she divorced him, and she became a businesswoman. Um, so prior to his scandal, they had been selling hams, and you may have seen Talmadge smoked hams in the grocery store, like I've actually seen them before. Um, so she started writing cookbooks, and she sort of like embraced her identity as like a southern matron, and tried to like sort of sell that image of herself. So I love a second act, right? So like as a, as a you know, middle-aged woman, she had to kind of reinvent herself and make her own money for the first time. So she started writing these cookbooks, and that's one of them, uh, Betty Talmadge's Lovejoy Plantation cookbook. Because they own the Lovejoy Plantation, which they try to pretend is Twelve Oaks, but again, none of these plantations were true. But for a long time, she told people that she lived at Twelve Oaks. Um, and I liked this piece too, from, from her obituary. They asked her, because um, in, in her book, she talks about how to cook a pig, like beginning to end, and one of the things you have to do is kill the pig. Uh, and she describes how easy she thought it was to kill the pig. She just pretended he was a male shepherd. Betty Talmadge is dark, y'all. Um, so what had happened was, uh, Betty Talmadge was like, hey, I want Gone with the Wind, because she had spent so long pretending that her house was part of Gone with the Wind, and so she tracked down the guy that was hiding the facade in his barn, and she bought it from him and hid it in her barn. Uh, her plan was to make, like, a Gone with the Wind museum, or to sell the facade, or to put the facade on a real house and, like, pay people, or have people pay to come look at it, but she never got around to it uh, before she died. But after she died, the Marietta Gone with the Wind museum bought it. So in case you were wondering, uh, where's Tara? It's in Marietta. Um, on the right, you can see the, the facade of the house. Uh, and this was in the scenes that were after Sherman came through and after uh, the Civil War, like the, the Confederate soldiers, you know, had all, were all using it as like a tea lousing station. Um, and then on the left, that's where it is uh, in Marietta. So people have really been fussing over this thing for a long time. And it's, really, it's just a movie set piece, but uh, it turned into like a whole sort of mystery. So speaking of which, here is the Marietta Gone with the Wind Museum. So it used to be in downtown Marietta, uh, but a couple of years ago they bought this little house, this white house you can see in the background there. Um, and it's part of like a bigger plantation, I think. And they have like big parties out there. Uh, and they have like a sort of Gone with the Wind festival, I think once a year. Um, and they have a lot of the outfits from the movie, as you can see. So if we were gonna go on a field trip, it's possible we could go there too. So. That is where that is. Again, I don't know where you're from. Possibly one of you is in Marietta right now, so you can go wave at all the outfits for us. Okay, so now we take a hard left turn. Um, so basically, 
he's examined the effect of Gone with the Wind on Georgia, and now he's looking at the other parts of Georgia that were involved in the war. And this is where it starts to get a little dark, because we are going to go um, look at the prison camp. Um, and again, like sincere trigger warning, there's some pictures. So basically, he starts to travel through Georgia. And one of the things that he finds is that there's a lot of groups that are like very specifically dedicated to the preservation of history and the preservation of Georgian history and Civil War history. And they get together and like, it's like a very important thing for them. And so he meets this woman, uh, Mario Phillips Jocelyn. And she, by the way, has several books. Uh, she's, she's a pretty um, well-published scholar. But one of the things that she does when she reads these uh, love letters that go back and forth for the prisoner of the war camps, because technically, even if you were a prisoner of war, you could receive letters, but only from family members. So everybody pretended to be aunts or cousins, remember? But I thought it was interesting what she said in regard to why she does this. So she said, I take the long view. People like me were the keepers of the past, like those monks with their Latin books back in the dark ages. When the revolution ends and people come looking for their history, we can say, here it is, we kept it for you. And, and I think that that has a lot of merit, really. Um, this idea that we do want a record of our history and we do want a clear, you know, and, and a concise view of what really did happen. And again, this is one of the things that I kind of want to talk about tomorrow, this idea of where does that end? Um, because a lot of people have been arguing that destroying the statues is destroying our history. And so I think it's kind of interesting that this woman believes herself to be keeping the history safe uh, and keeping it ready for when we want to go back and look at it. So that's kind of like her role in society, she thinks, is sort of like as a historian to like keep, keep the texts. And again, uh, that is historically a very, very common thing. Uh, the monks really did keep them through the Dark Ages. And I mean, you know, we have records of, of other wars going back thousands of years. So it's not unusual to keep records of what happened to people during a war. It's just the, the extent to which we keep the records or what the records look like or whether the records are physical statues is kind of what we're struggling with right now. So um, one of the things that they argued um, at the meeting that he went to and in his like further reading about Sherman was that Sherman was possibly not that bad. And I wanted to show you this because one of the things that they found when they went back through uh, private records, especially housing records, was that they didn't destroy that many private houses. And I thought that was so interesting because the only thing we ever hear about Sherman uh, was that he was the worst and he burned everything. And he, he did burn a lot of things. Um, but what Sherman really did that was so bad was that he went and took people's provisions. So as the army marched, they had to feed themselves and their horses. And so it wasn't that he burned all of the houses down, although they burned a little bit. Um, it was more that they took the food that people already needed. So how bad was Sherman? An interesting question. Apparently he had excellent manners. Sometimes he would just go stay in people's houses, but he wouldn't burn them down. He would just like chill there and then they move along. Um, so whether he was like really, really the worst is in question, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, and there are some delightful memes about him. I like that one especially. It used to be the thing in the Civil War, you've probably seen this, uh, and a little bit prior to the Civil War as well, to put your hand in your jacket at the middle. Um, why this was done is, is still in question, but if you ever see somebody doing that, that's what's going on there. Okay, so one of the things um, that we almost never talk about in, in history classes, um, and one of the things that they definitely left out of like Gone with the Wind, um, is the prisoners of war. So most of the time in war, um, especially back when we fought wars, like really with a sense of nobility, if you took prisoners, you didn't kill them. So if you've ever heard that phrase, take no prisoners, and you, and you may have, we hear that in action movies sometimes, when they say take no prisoners, what they mean is kill everyone. Um, it's, it's different than taking the prisoners. And the problem with taking prisoners is that you have to put them somewhere and you have to feed them and you have to take care of them and you have to like keep them alive and healthy because technically the rules of war require that once someone is taken prisoner, you have to like be nice to them. You have to treat them as well as your soldiers. It's just considered like honorable. So the problem um, with, with doing this is that very often prisoners of war are not treated well, especially if the war is like a really, um, like full of animosity, like a really angry war. And the other problem is that if your army is already struggling uh, for food and supplies and medicine, you're not gonna give it to the people that aren't even part of your army. So if you, for instance, are the Confederate army and you're already out of food and you certainly don't have blankets of clean water or, or morphine, you're not gonna give it to the Northerners. Um, and this is what we saw happen. So over the course of the Civil War, probably more than 400,000 people were captured. Um, 
about half of them were, were Northerners. So the South really did take a lot of prisoners. They really did take a lot of them alive. Um, so roughly like half and half-ish of the people who were actively imprisoned, a lot of people were captured and then sort of let go, but a lot of people were captured and imprisoned. So in the middle-ish of the war, um, they developed a prisoner exchange program. And this is also not unusual. Uh, very often opposing armies will trade prisoners, especially high-level prisoners. And it's done in part for morale, uh, but also in part just as, as a way of like honoring the nobility of war. Um, historically, that's been something that's important to us. Um, and we do still do this, by the way. Um, every once in a while in America, we'll take prisoners um, and then exchange them for other prisoners. Like we, I mean, we've done that in the last 10 years or so. So this idea that you will exchange valuable people is pretty common. But in the Civil War, we ran into a real problem because uh, the Confederate Army kept taking prisoners from the Northern Army, but they were taking free black men who were fighting as soldiers for the Northern Army, but they refused to acknowledge that they were free. So every time that the Confederate Army um, took prisoners of war that included black men, they enslaved the black men and they wouldn't give them back. And so the Northern Army was like, that's not what we agreed on. Like, just because you don't think they're free doesn't mean they're not free. And so that's why the exchange stopped. Um, basically, they were uh, going to exchange prisoner for prisoner, but since the Confederacy refused to do that, since they didn't consider black men to be free, then it all got kind of fucked up. So this is where it starts to get weird. So Andersonville, Georgia um, is in sort of the south central part of Georgia. And again, I don't know where you're from, uh, but maybe you know where that is. Um, technically, it was called Camp Sumter. So if that sounds more familiar, that might be what you know of it. So Andersonville um, was what, one of the worst prisoner of war camps, perhaps of all time. Um, again, it's kind of questionable, like a lot of shit went down in Vietnam as well, but basically the problem with, with Andersonville um, was that they built it on essentially a swamp and there was no source of clean water. So the people who worked at Andersonville, uh, like the Confederate soldiers who like were, were guards of the camp, they camped upriver, so they had access to clean water, but everybody else was downriver. So by the time the water got to uh, the people who were in the prison camp, it was just full of, you know, bacteria and diseases and all of the things we were talking about. So most of the people uh, died from dysentery or died from typhoid. But a lot, a lot, a lot of people died in this camp. And again, remember, they weren't supposed to. You are supposed to keep prisoners of war safe and healthy. Like, you know, it's not supposed to be a luxury hotel or whatever, but you're supposed to keep them alive and safe and healthy. And they did not do this at Andersonville. It was just a straight up disaster. Um, every time it rained, the whole place turned into mud. Uh, every time it didn't rain for a long time, the whole place turned into dust. Um, you know, there was no shade. There was no like cleanliness. This is an actual picture from Andersonville. So you can see the degree to which everybody's pretty, pretty well packed in there. Um, they had, for one thing, far too many people. It was built to hold about 2,000 people and they ended up with sometimes, you know, upwards of 20,000 people. Um, no, I think more. At least not, at one point they had 40,000. So basically, everybody died. Uh, 13,000 men died there. And again, these were men who were supposed to die. Like these were men who were not involved in active combat. These were men who were supposed to have been kept safe. And they mostly died from like gangrene uh, when they listed their causes of death. At one point they listed nostalgia, which I thought was really interesting. I assume they're talking about depression, like a, like a, a pretty epic depression, perhaps some sort of anxiety, depression combination. I don't know. Like I assume those people just, you know, died of not trying anymore, but basically there was no latrine system and there was no fresh water. So one guy who was there described it as basically a swamp crusted with human waste, which like, bleh. uh, okay. So buckle up. Here's some pictures. Um, on the left is sort of um, a big picture view of what Andersonville looked like. And you can see the big path sort of going through the middle, but you can also see the way that the land was shaped is sort of tilted down like not, not, not majorly, like it wasn't a valley, but it tilted downward. So of course, what happened was all of the human waste and excrement and mud sort of ended up in the middle. Um, so if you were lucky, you might be on the outside, but basically everything that was terrible about it sort of ended up in the middle. And on the left um, is a, another picture of the way that it looked. Um, and again, I just wanted to show it to you because I think it's easier to imagine these things historically if we can like literally look at a picture of it. Um, so it was, the worst. Um, so again, buckle up. These pictures are real. Um, on the left, these are some of the northern soldiers shortly before they were released. And on the right, that guy was still alive when that picture was taken. Which, 
feels contrary to belief, but he was. Um, and so when the war ended and when especially the, the Northern soldiers came to like close the prison and release all these people, this is what they saw. And they were like, oh, hell no. And so basically, I'm going to put the switch, you don't have to look at that anymore. Uh, basically, they got in a lot of trouble. Uh, people who had run Andersonville and the, the guy who was in charge of it specifically, because one of the things that they talk about in the book was that they started running out of ways to bury all of the people who died. So they started out burying them in coffins, and then they ran out of coffins, and then they started burying them covered in planks, and then they ran out of planks, and then they just started it with mass graves. So if it reminds you of the Holocaust, it should. Uh, it was very similar in regard to like how they dealt with it and the sort of lack of humanity with which they were treating the people who were imprisoned. And so it, it's one of those things that is so incredibly dark that that's probably why we don't teach it, but I think we're really doing the, those soldiers a disservice. Um, so Walt Whitman, who you probably know, a very famous poet, said that there are deeds and crimes that may be forgiven, but this is not among them. So it was a problem. Um, and sorry to sort of like uh, break the tone here, but the person that I thought was the most interesting was Anne Williams uh, that they referenced. Um, in the official records that they kept at Andersonville, there was a woman who showed up. Uh, on, on the 17th of January and quote, had sexual intercourse with at least seven prisoners, um, but they decided that she was not a prostitute because she didn't charge them. So I guess like, thanks, Mary Williams, like, you know, doing your part for the cause there, I guess. Like, I have no idea why that was legal, why they let this woman in, uh, who she chose to have sex with and why, but I, I, you know, I sort of support her patriotism. Like, you gotta do what you can for America. And that's what Ann Williams could do, I guess. Uh, so here is the guy uh, who was in charge. So this is Henry Beards, and he's kind of interesting. So he was um, from Switzerland, but he basically, he came to Louisiana when he was pretty young and decided to be a physician. And in those days, there was med school, but you didn't necessarily have to go. You could just, as I said, hang out your shingle. You could just basically like study with the doctor for a while, or in some cases, just like read some books, or in some cases, just like decide you're a doctor. Uh, there wasn't like a licensing program. So Henry Beards was ultimately put in charge because they thought he was a doctor and that he would take care of the prisoners, but he didn't. And so what was found after they closed the war uh, camp and sent all of the prisoners who were still alive home was that he had done a lot of like embezzling, uh, a lot of the food that they sent, like he had kept and sold, um, a lot of the like medicine that they sent, you know, they had kept and sold. So he was the first ever uh, person in the Civil War who was tried for crimes of war. So basically, some people have been trying to sort of apologize for what he did. So when they put up that historical marker, their argument was that there was no way he could have kept those prisoners alive and healthy. They said even if he'd been an angel, he couldn't have changed uh, the pitiful tale of probation. And like, uh, maybe. But also the records show that he did have access to food and he just wasn't giving it to them. Um, so he was hung. And um, I wanted to show you this picture of his hanging. It's not gruesome. It's just, I mean, he's on a scaffold, but he's not hanging in the picture. But I wanted to show it to you because in, in the olden days, um, hanging was considered like a public event. Um, so it used to be that essentially if, if somebody had a trial and they decided that, that person would be hung, everybody would go watch like in a, in a town, um, like people would just sort of go gather around and watch the person be hung, and it was considered appropriate for everybody, uh, women, children, all the people. In this case, uh, he's surrounded by soldiers, you can tell by the bayonets, but it was still very much a public event. Like you can see all those people looking over the fence, like watch this guy get hung. But what they decided was that he had committed war crimes. Uh, they tried him specifically for a conspiracy and for murder. Um, and they said that he had subjected, you know, the soldiers to torture and great suffering uh, by, you know, confining them, uh, by exposing them to the weather. Um, so basically, he did such a bad job and treated these people with such a lack of humanity um, that he was considered, it was considered a literal crime against humanity, um, and he was hung for it. Which I'm okay with, but um, a lot of people are not. So after he visits Andersonville, he goes to this meeting where there's all these sort of like, apologists uh, that are trying to get Veers' name cleared, and they're trying to argue, like that quote that we just saw, that there was nothing he could have done, that, that prison is prison, um, which I thought was really interesting as well. And so what these two guys that he interviewed at that meeting are arguing is that people essentially have been talking so much shit about the Confederacy that they are trying to swing the pendulum back the other direction so that ultimately it will end up in the middle.
if that makes sense. So basically, the Confederacy looks really, really bad right now. So what they're trying to do is make the Confederacy look really, really good, even if technically that is not accurate, so that it will end up back in the middle. Because their argument is that they, that we shouldn't talk about how bad Andersonville was because it makes the South look bad. Uh, and this argument may sound familiar to you if you've been seeing the news about like we shouldn't test people for COVID because then it makes us look bad. This is a very similar argument. So basically these guys are arguing that the Yankees started it, um, <laughs> which again, uh, and that they're kind of fighting back, that, that it may seem one-sided, but what they're trying to do is sort of correct the course of history in such a way that it ends up on a little bit more of an even playing field. Um, and so again, this is one of the things that I'm interested in hearing what y'all think, because basically every year they celebrate the anniversary of his death, and they lay like a wreath on his uh, memorial, and they talk about how he really wasn't that bad, um, which is bizarre, because, you know, he was, he was literally hung for war crimes, but like, maybe not. Like, you know, you want to be fair, but like, so that's what's happening with beards. Okay, so the last place that he goes um, is actually sort of a nice little palate cleanser. He finds this town called Fitzgerald. And in Fitzgerald, what they did um, was they realized that it was like very poor and nobody wanted to live there. So they gave land grants uh, to former Union soldiers and let them move to Fitzgerald. And they basically built this like colony uh, where a lot of retired Union soldiers lived and everybody got along and it was pretty peaceful. So basically they were like, you know, the war is over. Uh, you fought on one side, I fought on the other side. Here we are now. Maybe we could just be chill. It was like, oh, okay. Oh, well, that seems nice. Uh, so Fitzgerald's still there. Uh, every year they have Confederate Memorial Day, but they also have Yankee Memorial Day. And I think that's kind of fair. They just sort of acknowledge both sides and have barbecues. And I think that's the best version of the future that we can hope for. Okay, so now we are at the last chapter, uh, last chapter of the book. And this chapter is called Strike the Tent, uh, which is of course a great name, and also Robert E. Lee's last words. Um, so basically, he's trying to sort of figure out how to end his journey. And so what he decides to do is go back and do the thing that he did before to sort of like create a full circle event. So he goes back with Rob, uh, back to uh, Shenandoah, they can do Pickett's Charge again. And I, I don't know, but for some reason it just really bothered me that Rob just doesn't wash his uniform. And I guess he's trying to be historically accurate, but like Jesus Christ, dude, like it's been, it's been like 12 years. Washer, wool, Rob, damn. Uh, so there's Rob on the right. He's so intense. I actually sort of love him. Um, so basically, they're redoing Pickett's Charge, which they did at the beginning, you might remember, where they're like, wow, they go real fast for like 12 miles. And, what ends up happening is that all of these other people are there and are watching because they're doing it on the anniversary. Oh, I think it's the Battle of Shiloh, sorry. Uh, they're doing it on the anniversary and a lot of other people are there reenacting the battle and all they do is the charge and they refuse to fight, which I thought was really interesting as well. Like the people who consider themselves hardcore don't take part in the fighting because they consider the fighting to be inauthentic. Um, but one of the things that he describes, and this is one of my questions for you for tomorrow, is this concept of a period rush. Um, so when he describes a period rush, it's basically like when he gets so into, especially the authenticity of the moment, that it's like he can really imagine what it felt like for the other people who were there. And it's sort of this feeling of like euphoria and clarity and like meaning. And basically, I think this is sort of like the high that Rob is chasing. I think that he sort of get something from this uh, that the rest of us possibly can't imagine. Although I'm very curious to know if you guys have ever experienced anything like this. But basically he's like, he's so in it that he also like he's almost high. So he calls it a period rush. And the author um, sort of understands this, but not entirely. And so this is one of the author's quotes that I thought was really meaningful um, from the book about why people might do this. Like, why would you even bother with this? And he says, for me, this was the principal joy of reenacting. It restored my appreciation of simple things, cold water, a crust of bread, and cool patch of shade. And like, you know, all right, all right, all right. You know, like when you come home from camping and you use a flush toilet, you're like, oh, this is great. You know, like, I guess that's kind of what he's talking about. Like, I, I don't know. Uh, but I like this picture too. This is the author, this is Tony Horowitz uh, and Rob. Um, I think this is from the Civil War guys, but this might have been from the 12th Mile March. Um, and I thought that was kind of beautiful, the sentiment that, like, he can understand to a degree why you would reenact things. Although, again, I don't feel like you have to reenact to experience these joys, but I get it. Like, that that would be nice. And then, 
Um, the, the sort of the final thing that I want to talk about is the way that we remember the war and why. So this is kind of the way that he describes it, is this um, nostalgia. And I think that this is what we were talking about two weeks ago. I think that this is, when we talk about like Make America Great Again, I think this is kind of what they're talking about. Because he describes it as nostalgia for a time when the South seemed a cohesive region, upholding Christian values and agrarian ways. And that makes sense to me. Like I can imagine why someone would want to go back to that. Like a peaceful farming village where everybody believes the same thing. Um, and there's a lot of like social cohesion. Like that makes sense to me. Humans love that. That's our jam is when we have like social cohesion, uh, especially when we all believe the same religion, like humans love that. But this idea of looking at this period of time with reference, I think is very, very selective. And that's, I think what people who are into this sort of like heritage, not hate thing are getting into is this idea that they're looking at the plantation owners, but literally not anyone else. They're not looking at the poor white people. They're not looking at any of the black people. They're not looking at any of the recent immigrants. Like they're, we're, they're looking back nostalgically at what like four or five rich people were experiencing and not what literally everyone else in town was experiencing. And they're also not looking at the reality of it, you know, like it, it was a very hard life. Uh, even, even to be a plantation owner it was, it was, not easy um, and it was in a lot of ways deeply unpleasant and I think that we sort of put our little blinders on and forget that you know and look at only the good parts so in a way I can understand this like a, a small farm town where everybody is nice and Christian like yeah of course you want to hold on to that like that sounds peaceful uh, but this idea that you are selectively remembering parts of your heritage is I think kind of what's going on here I think might be the issue with this um, and I've seen a lot of this lately from the heritage not hate crowd there's been a lot of this sort of noise about like, well, we're just trying to hold on to our heritage. And it's like, what part of your heritage? You know, like, and was that your heritage? Like, it's, it's, it's a very tricky thing. So this, this nostalgia, I think, is in a lot of ways blind. Uh, but at the same time, I get nostalgia, right? Like, if you think about Christmas, we all have this sort of like mental picture of what Christmas looks like, where it's like, you know, it's snowing and you have a Christmas tree and there's stockings and a fire and your family's there. But if you think about reality, like this, this no, no one's Christmas. First of all, it never snows here. Uh, and a lot of people hate their families. Uh, and a lot of people are too poor for Christmas. Uh, and a lot of people have to work on Christmas. And you know what I mean? Like, we, we have this idea of what, like, Thanksgiving looks like and the reality of what Thanksgiving looks like is not like that and I think this is sort of that same thing we have this idea of what the antebellum South looked like and the reality of it I think would be quite surprising uh, for a lot of the people who are focused on it so on the one hand there's that on the other hand when he talks about the Civil War it is important to recognize that it was different um, than a lot of the other wars that we had had before and we have not had a war like it since um, so one of the things that made the Civil War really different was it was pre-industrial so we had guns, um, but we did not yet have a lot of the other stuff. Uh, we did not yet have tanks, for instance, which we're going to get into in our next war. Um, we didn't have machine guns, for instance, which we're going to get into in our next war. Uh, we certainly didn't have like planes or blimps or any of that. So this was our last war that we fought kind of hand to hand. Uh, this was the last time that we saw people that were, you know, like brother against brother, um, everybody standing on the same ground you know like these days we fight a lot of our wars even with drones like we, we just don't fight like this anymore um and this was a very different way to be because these days war is very anonymous we don't know those people that's not even our country you know like we, we might not even go there and look at them but for the people who were fighting in the civil war it was very personal um and it was very bodily in a way that it kind of isn't anymore like we just don't really do hand-to-hand -hand combat anymore so this was a major transition all of our wars prior to this had been hand-to-hand -hand combat horses knives uh muskets yes but all the wars after this were a dramatically different thing um and it was a lot more industrial it was a lot more anonymous it was a lot more feelingless kind of uh so the civil war was like it was personal like it was you versus you know your cousin uh but the wars after this are largely impersonal it's basically like we sent a bunch of 19 year olds somewhere else so that was a key thing and that part that part very true the idea that it was a different war 
Um, and similarly, it was the last war that we fought where location mattered so much because again, we didn't have transports. I mean, we had trains, but most of the time the troops had to march. So they march, 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 and they march, march, march. So this was the last time that we really had to carefully consider weather um, and supplies, you know, like tanks eat fuel, I guess, but horses eat food. So if you're gonna take a whole bunch of horses somewhere, you've gotta have something for them to eat. And if you're gonna take a whole bunch of soldiers somewhere, you've gotta have something for them to eat. And if everybody is walking, you've gotta have things to eat along the way. Like you can't pack six months worth of food in your backpack. Um, so this was the last war where that kind of thing was really important. It was fought in fields. It was, you know, it was pastoral. There were horses. So this was the last time that like how long a person could walk in one day mattered. Um, it was sort of the last time that the weather mattered. The weather did matter in World War I or World War II a little bit. This is why we don't fight land wars in Russia. Uh, but this is, this is sort of the last time that like we had everybody on foot. And so again, it was a different war. It was, it was different than we ever did it again. So. This is the part that I'm uh, curious about us talking about this week. This idea that in a lot of ways, the Civil War acts as a sort of a talisman um, for a life that's gone past. And so he argues that for many Southerners, remembrance of the war, a remembrance of the war have become a talisman against modernity, an emotional lever for their reactionary politics. So one of the things you know that's been really happening in America right now in terms of this divisiveness is this idea that um, the new world is scary. And this is true. Humans hate change. I, I am one of them. I hate change. Uh, but this idea that if you, for instance, as a white man, were told that basically you were going to be on top forever, that you were the best people in America, and you were going to own all the businesses, the college was going to be no problem, and you were always going to be wealthy, and you could reasonably expect that your sons would have the same thing. That's how we sort of lived in America for a long, 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 long time. But in the last, you know, few decades, that has become not necessarily the case. Um, a lot of white people don't have hope that their children will have a better life than them. A shocking amount of uh, humans, especially in the Southeast, especially Southern white people in the Southeast, are actually going down in terms of economic stratification. So historically, again, white men in the South have expected to rise and expected their children to continue to rise. And what we seen in the last couple of decades is that in fact they're going downward um, and as you can imagine that would be very upsetting like if you if you expected to be on top of the world and then surprise you're not like you'd be pissed and so his argument is the thing that these men are so mad about is their change in their fortunes and so they're sort of looking at this war as a, as a symbol of when things went wrong so the idea is like essentially if we had won the war we could just go back to those values and then we would continue to be on top is the unspoken part of that message. And so his argument is that people are afraid of modernity. Uh, they are afraid of the way that the world is changing around them. They are afraid of losing their place at the top. And so the war itself and the Confederacy itself serves as like a talisman for when things were good. And so when, you know, again, we want to make America great again, very often what it means is we want to send it back to a time we could reasonably expect uh, that we would be on top and so too were our sons. And so I think this picture, by the way, I think this picture is gorgeous in terms of like uh, photojournalism. I think this is a top notch piece. But basically, you know, in the back, it says USA equals white homeland. Um, and that's kind of where they're going with this, this idea that America is supposed to be the place where white men succeed. And so the idea that perhaps it might not be terrifying. So again, this is one of the things that I want to talk to you about because, uh, you know, hopefully, in addition to reading your book, you have been uh, looking around the world and, and kind of seeing what you see. And I don't know if you saw this guy. I did. I had a real weird week last week. Uh, so I'm just, I'm, I'm curious to see what, what went on in your world. So this is the last one, I promise. Um, the, the sort of final question that he has in regard to the end of this book is, is about the issue that was at stake in the Civil War. Uh, which was essentially, are we two different countries? And do we need to be two different countries? And if not, are we going to be able to come back together again and fight and live as one united country? And so his question was essentially, um, the issues at stake in the Civil War, race in particular, remained raw and unsolved, as did the broad question that the conflict posed, would America remain one nation? And after all this time, I think we are facing this question again. Um, are we going to remain one nation, like we're again, we're more divided politically than ever before, uh, sort of, we're not really, most Americans think most of the same things, but like the news keeps telling us that we're divided. 
Um, but this is kind of, I think, our, our ultimate question is like, is, is America one united country? Is that what we want? And is that something we can maintain? And so again, even though this book is old, man, this book's from 1996, we're still asking all the same questions um, and we're still dealing with it in a way that's, I think, different than your parents dealt with it and different than their grandparents dealt with it, but it's still, you know, an ongoing question. So, um, let me stop sharing and come back to your faces. There you all are. Okay. I know that was heavy. Uh, and I know that this is a lot of, a lot of big stuff and a lot of big heavy stuff. And I'm sorry that it got a little, a little dark today, but I'm so glad that we're talking about this book in the middle of uh, everything else that's going on in the world. Um, I think this is an important thing to be talking about right now. And I hope that you're talking about it, you know, outside of class as well. Like I, I, I'm curious again to find out tomorrow the extent to which it's like present in your social media and present in your household. Um, because I didn't anticipate this being a question we would ask ourselves in the year 2020, but here we are. Um, so does anybody have any pressing questions before we disband for the day? Okay. 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 Well, so tomorrow um, we will gather back together in our discussion groups. So make sure that you're keeping in mind, um, you know, before we get uh, back together to talk about these things, like what you've seen, uh, what you saw over the past couple of weeks, and the ways that this is like kind of personal to your life. Uh, because again, here we are in Georgia, some of us, some of you are in other places. Uh, but you know, here we are in like the place where it happened. And so I'm just, I'm I want you to get these thoughts in your head so that we can uh, really dig into it tomorrow. If you have any other questions, uh, send me an email. Otherwise, uh, please read your book so we can talk about it. It's so good. You're gonna like it, I promise. It's not like the last book, if you hated the last book. Um, and other than that, as always, stay safe. Uh, there's a lot of weird things happening out there. And I will see you tomorrow morning or afternoon. Okay, goodbye.